On December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, USS Nevada was the only battleship that was able to get underway, heroically making a desperate run for the sea, though she would be forced to beach herself to keep from sinking. But part of this run was in a valiant effort to protect her only sister, USS Oklahoma. But sadly, though she tried, she wasn't able to save her. And Oklahoma would become one of the major casualties of Pearl Harbor, along with USS Arizona. USS Oklahoma was the second of the two Nevada-class battleships, the first, of course, being USS Nevada, which were ordered in a Naval Appropriation Act on March 4th, 1911. This new class of ship was actually the first of the US Navy's standard type battleships. Twelve of those would be completed by 1923, and with those ships, the Navy would create a fleet of modern battleships that were similar in long-range gunnery, speed, turning radius, and protection capabilities. Though as technology progressed, many differences could be seen in the standard types, as later models would of course have improvements, and there were some innovations in the Nevada classes. For example, triple turrets and the all-or-nothing armor principle, which concentrated most, if not all, of the armor around the ship's critical areas while leaving minimal to no protection around non-critical points. The triple turrets actually reduced the length needed for the ship, and therefore reduced area that needed protecting, as they could place ten guns in four turrets instead of five, and this allowed for thicker armor. The Nevada class were also the first US battleships to be oil-fired instead of coal-fired, and because oil had more recoverable energy per ton than coal did, it increased their potential range. And the sisters weren't actually identical. USS Nevada was fitted with new technology in the form of steam turbines, but Oklahoma wound up getting triple expansion steam engines. As built, Oklahoma's standard displacement was 27,941 tons. At full load, she displaced 28,856 tons. She was 583 feet, 178 meters long, and had a beam of 95 feet 6 inches, 29.11 meters, as well as a draft of 28 feet 6 inches, 8.69 meters. Those triple expansion steam engines she utilized, which provided about 24,800 horsepower, were fueled by 12 oil-fired Babcock and Wilcox boilers, and this gave her a speed of about 20.5 knots, that's 38 kilometers an hour, or 23.6 miles per hour. Her design range was 8,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. In her original as-built form, her belt armor was 13 and a half to only 8 inches, and deck armor was 3 inches thick. She had 10 14-inch guns that were arranged in two triple and two twin mounts. She also had 21 5-inch guns as well as at least two torpedo tubes, though, interestingly, some references to her original design say she had four? Why this element is even confused at all, I'm not really sure. But she had two or four torpedo tubes, and her crew consisted of 864 officers and enlisted men. Her keel was laid down on October 26, 1912, by the New York Shipbuilding Corporation of Camden, New Jersey, which had bid... $5,926,000 to construct her. By December 12th, that same year, she was about 11.2% complete. And by July 13th, 1913, she was at 33%. She was finally launched on March 23rd, 1914, sponsored by Lorena J. Cruz, who was the daughter of the Oklahoma governor, Lee Cruz. Her launch was actually a little unique as it was preceded by an invocation, which was the first time that it happened for an American warship in half a century, given by Elijah Embry Haas, who was a bishop of the Methodist Episcopal Church. And she was moved to a dock for fitting out. But on the night of July 19th, 1915, fires were actually discovered underneath the four main battery turrets. And it was actually the third time that it happened on an American battleship in less than a month. Suspicious, but by July 22nd, the Navy felt that, at least in Oklahoma's case, it had been caused by defective insulation, 
or a mistake by a dockyard worker. But the fire delayed her completion so much that her sister Nevada wound up conducting her sea trials and was commissioned before Oklahoma. On October 23rd, 1915, she was about 98% complete. And that spring, May 2nd, 1916, she was finally commissioned in Philadelphia with Captain Roger Wells in command. Her early service life was relatively uneventful even into World War I. As I've repeatedly stated, there was not a lot to do for warships in World War I by the time America got involved. Prior to even entering the war, Oklahoma just kind of dawdled around the east coast of the United States, visiting Navy shipyards. And in 1917, she actually had a refit, with two 3-inch guns being installed forward of the main mast for anti-aircraft defense, and nine of her 5-inch guns being removed or repositioned. Even when we did finally enter World War I, Oklahoma was not sent across the Atlantic initially, because she was, again, oil-fired. The UK did not want oil-fired ships to help them out because they didn't have access to that much oil, if any at all. They wanted coal, so Oklahoma had to stay behind for a while. And her crew, though cramped, actually had a lot of advantages for education available to them. And to kill time, they engaged in athletic competitions, like boxing, wrestling, and rowing, with crews of battleship USS Texas, as well as a tug named Ontario. These competitions actually developed into the establishment of many athletic teams all across the service that helped build camaraderie. On August 13th, 1918, Oklahoma was finally allowed to join Battleship Division 6 under the command of Rear Admiral Thomas S. Rogers and depart for Europe alongside her sister, Nevada. By August 23rd, they met up with some destroyers 275 miles west of Ireland, and with them, they made way for Barrahaven, where they waited for 18 days for their cousin, USS Utah, to arrive. That division remained at anchor, and they were tasked to protect American convoys coming into the area, but they were only ever called out of the harbor once in 80 days. Like I said, there wasn't much for warships to do by this point in World War I, so they kind of just hung around. On October 14th, 1918, while they were under the command of Charles B. McVeigh Jr., Oklahoma escorted troop ships into port at the United Kingdom and returned by October 16th. Generally, during the time, they would just conduct drills at Anchor or in nearby Bantry Bay. Other than that, the crew would just play sports like American football or competitive sailing. Sounds like they kind of had a really nice vacation for being involved in World War I, honestly. Though, she did actually suffer six casualties between October 21st and November 2nd of 1918, though that wasn't due to anything combat-related. That was due to the 1918 flu pandemic. And Oklahoma would remain off Bearhaven until the end of the war on November 11th, 1918. Now that we've entered the interwar period, it's probably not a surprise that there really wasn't a lot happening during this time, but I'll give you the cliff notes, since some of you may already know that Oklahoma's World War II career was not very long. Oklahoma left for the Isle of Portland on the 26th of November and was joined there by USS Arizona on the 30th. USS Nevada showed up on the 4th of December, and the rest of Battleship Division 9's ships shortly after that. They were assigned as a convoy escort for the ocean liner SS George Washington, which was indeed carrying President Woodrow Wilson. It was on his way for the peace talks in France. Oklahoma departed on December 14th for New York City, and spent early 1919 conducting winter battle drills off the coast of Cuba. On June 15th, 1919, she then returned to France to escort President Wilson on a second trip, and then went back to New York on July 8th. She remained a part of the Atlantic Fleet for the next two years after that, and was overhauled and her crew trained. Her second battery would wind up being reduced from 20 to 12, and early in 1921, she actually traveled to the west coast of South America for combined exercises with the Pacific Fleet, and would return later that same year for the Peruvian Centennial. 
After that, she would actually join up with the Pacific Fleets and in 1925, begin a high-profile training cruise with several other battleships. They left San Francisco on April 15, 1925 and arrived in Hawaii on April 27th, where they spent their time performing war games. On July 1st, they left for Samoa and crossed the equator on July 6th. By July 27th, they had arrived in Australia and conducted a number of exercises there as well, before spending some more time in New Zealand, and finally returned to the U.S. later in the year. In 1927, she transited the Panama Canal and moved to join the scouting fleet, but in November of 1927, she entered Philadelphia Navy Yard for a very extensive overhaul. She had to be modernized, and that was performed by adding eight five-inch guns, and her turret's maximum elevation was raised from 15 to 30 degrees to enhance their range. She also had an aircraft catapult installed atop turret number three, and she was up-armored between September 1927 and July of 1929, and given anti-torpedo bulges, as well as an additional two inches of steel on her armor deck. That overhaul would increase her beam to 108 feet, which was the widest in the U.S. Navy, but it would reduce her speed to 19.68 knots. But it wasn't a major reduction, and it was seen as worth it given the extra protection the crew would have. After she was done, she rejoined the scouting fleet for exercises in the Caribbean, and then returned to the West Coast in June of 1930 for spring operations all the way to 1936. The summer of that year, she wound up carrying midshipmen on a European training cruise, visiting northern ports. The cruise was actually interrupted, though, by the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. Oklahoma wound up sailing for Bilbao, arriving there on July 24, 1936, specifically to rescue American citizens and other refugees from the war. She carried them to Gibraltar and other French ports, and then returned to Norfolk on September 11th, and to the West Coast on October 24th. For the next four years, she mostly just did further fleet operations, some of which were conducted jointly with the Army, and included the training of reservists. Oklahoma was actually based at Pearl Harbor from December 29th, 1937, for patrols and exercises, and during this time only returned to the mainland twice, once to have further anti-aircraft guns and armor added to her superstructure at Puget Sound in early February 1941, and once more to have armor replaced at San Pedro in mid-August of that same year. En route on August 22nd, she actually got trapped in a severe storm. One man was swept overboard, and three others were injured. The following morning, she wound up breaking her starboard propeller shaft, and that forced her to halt so the crew could assess damage and then sail to San Francisco, which was the closest Navy yard with an adequate dry dock to service her. She remained there until mid-October, but with the work completed, she then returned to Hawaii. Though even by this point, Oklahoma was looked at as a bit of an old design. Many newer battleships offered much better performance in pretty much every single category, and the Navy had already planned to retire her on May 2nd, 1942. But with her work done and her returning to Hawaii, her lifespan would actually be cut even shorter than that. December 7th, 1941. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. USS Oklahoma was sitting in Battleship Row in berth Fox 5, on the outboard position, sitting right next to a fellow battleship, USS Maryland. Her sister Nevada was also present, and quite a few positions behind her. When the Japanese descended on the harbor, Oklahoma was pretty much immediately targeted and struck by three torpedoes. The first and second hit just seconds apart, and struck her amidships, around 7.50, they had hit about 20 feet below the waterline, between the smokestack and the main mast, and the torpedoes had blown away a large section of her anti-torpedo bulge, and spilled oil from the fuel bunker's sounding tubes. But neither one had actually penetrated the hull, so she was not necessarily in danger of sinking at that point. Around 80 men scrambled to man her anti-aircraft guns and fight back, but they couldn't use them 
because the firing locks were actually in the armory. Oklahoma had been robbed of her ability to fire back. So most of the men wound up manning battle stages below her waterline or sought shelter in her third deck, which was protocol during an aerial attack. Then a third torpedo struck her at eight o'clock, right around frame 65. And that hit close to where the first two had, and this one penetrated the hull. The explosion destroyed adjacent fuel bunkers on the second platform deck and ruptured excess trunks to the two forward boiler rooms. With her hull penetrated, she started taking on water at a very rapid pace, and she began to capsize on her port side. While this was happening, two more torpedoes hit her, and the Japanese strafed her crew as they tried to abandon ship. In less than 12 minutes, she rolled over until she was halted by her own mass touching the bottom. Her starboard side remained above the water, and a part of her keel was exposed. It's believed she probably took around eight torpedoes in total, but a lot of her crew bravely didn't give up. They simply jumped over to USS Maryland to assist with manning her anti-aircraft batteries. However, 429 of Oklahoma's officers and enlisted men were either confirmed killed or missing. One of those killed, Father Aloysius Schmidt, was actually the first American chaplain of any faith to die in World War II. 32 others were confirmed wounded, but many were still alive and were trapped within Oklahoma's hull. Even while the attack was still ongoing, efforts to rescue the trapped men began almost immediately, and work continued into the night, trying to cut through Oklahoma's hull, but this was no easy task since, of course, the hull was designed not to be cut through by anything. It was armored. To a certain extent, they were able to pull this off, as some men were pulled from Oklahoma after being stuck inside her for hours. One individual, Julio De Castro, was a Hawaiian civil yard worker who had managed to organize a team that saved 32 of Oklahoma's crew. The rescue operation was further hampered, not just from the fact they had to cut into Oklahoma's hull, but also the fact they had to be really careful about this. See, every time they did it, it released trapped air, and that would raise water levels around men that were still inside. On top of that, if they cut in the really, really wrong places, it could also ignite stored fuel. And even if they did everything perfectly, it was pretty understood that they just didn't have the resources to reach everyone in time. But they did what they could. Many awards and honors were issued to members of Oklahoma's crew following the attack. This included Father Schmidt, who I mentioned earlier, who had a Buckley-class destroyer escort named after him that was commissioned in 1943. Additionally, two men, Seaman First Class James R. Ward and Ensign Francis C. Flaherty, were awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously, as both of them remained inside turrets, holding flashlights to allow other members of the crew to see to escape. But by doing this, they didn't give themselves enough time to escape, and both would die on board USS Oklahoma. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Navy had to analyze what they should do with the ships that had been sunk, several of which, like West Virginia and California, would be refloated and returned to service, though it would take some time. Oklahoma, however, was seen as a bit of a more difficult prospect. For one thing, her design was already quite old, and for two, she had taken a lot of damage and had capsized. But they also couldn't leave her where she was either, like Arizona and Utah, who still serve as war graves to this day, because Oklahoma was a navigational hazard. She had rolled into the harbor's navigational channel, so she really couldn't stay there. The Navy did determine by early 1942 that she could indeed be salvaged, and even though it was cost prohibitive to do it, they still undertook the project on July 15th, 1942, under the immediate command of Captain F.H. Whitaker and a team from the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. Just preparing to ride her took eight months to complete. They had to pump air into her interior chambers and improvise airlocks to force 20,000 tons of water out of her through the torpedo holes. 4,500 tons of coral soil were also deposited in front of her bow to prevent her from sliding, and two barges were posted on either side to control her rise. 
21 derricks were attached to the upturned hull, each carried high tensile steel cables, and were connected to hydraulic winching machines ashore. The operation finally began on March 8, 1943, and they were finished by June 16, 1943. Teens of naval specialists then entered her to remove human remains, and then they constructed coffer dams to allow for basic repairs so that she could be refloated properly. That work was completed by November, and on December 28th, she was towed into dry dock number two at Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. Once there, her main guns, machinery, remaining ammunition, and stores were all removed. Further repairs were completed on her hull to make her 100% watertight, and by this point, giving her a once-over, the U.S. Navy did deem her too old and too heavily damaged to be returned to service. As such, she was decommissioned on September 1st, 1944, and all remaining armaments and her superstructure were then removed. She was put up for auction at the Brooklyn Navy Yard on November 26, 1946, after the war was already over, and was finally sold to Moore Dry Dock Company of Oakland, California, for $46,127. In May of 1947, two tugs started towing Oklahoma from Pearl Harbor to San Francisco Bay. She was due to arrive, interestingly, on Memorial Day, and a delegation of nearly 500 Oklahomans that were being led by then-Governor Roy J. Turner were planning to visit and pay final respects to their ship. But Oklahoma seemed to have different ideas. Some say that ships, of course, are just tools, but many sailors were say that they each have their own personalities, and spirits, as it were. Maybe we humans take too much time to personify inanimate objects and vehicles especially, but in any event, Oklahoma didn't seem to want to be scrapped. On May 17th, the ships entered a storm that was more than 500 miles from Hawaii. The tug, Hercules, put her searchlight on Oklahoma and revealed that she had begun listing heavily. They then radioed the naval base at Pearl Harbor and were instructed to turn around and head back to port. But without warning, Hercules was pulled back past the other tug, Monarch, which was also being dragged backwards at about 15 knots. Oklahoma had decided she was going to sink straight down, and she threatened to take both the tugs with her. But the tug skippers had wisely opted to loosen their cable drums that connected their tow lines, so as Oklahoma sank away, the lines would wind up playing out. Monarch was released first, but Hercules' cables didn't let go until the last possible moment, and that sent her tossing and pitching in the rough seas, but she would also make it. Oklahoma had gone out on her own terms, and to date, her exact location still isn't known. In the modern day, there are several memorials to Oklahoma. During dredging operations in 2006, the U.S. Navy actually recovered a part of the Oklahoma from Pearl Harbor. They think it's a portion of the portside rear fire control tower. It's now on permanent outdoor display at the Muscogee War Memorial Park in, well, Muscogee, Oklahoma. Her aft wheel is at the Oklahoma History Center in Oklahoma City. And on December 7, 2007, the 66th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, a memorial for the 429 crew members who were killed in the attack was dedicated on Ford Island, just outside the entrance to where the battleship Missouri is docked as a museum. Missouri is actually moored exactly where Oklahoma was moored when she sank. And the Oklahoma Memorial is part of the Pearl Harbor National Memorial, and is an arrangement of engraved black granite walls and white marble posts. In the years following the attack, only 35 of the 429 sailors and marines who died in Oklahoma were actually identified. The remains of 394 unidentified sailors and marines were first interred as unknowns, but were actually disinterred in 1947 in an unsuccessful attempt to identify them. In 1950, all the unidentified remains from Oklahoma were buried in 61 caskets in 45 graves at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. <laughs>
But further work has been done in this regard. In April of 2015, the Department of Defense announced that as part of a policy change that established a threshold criteria for disinterment of unknowns, that the unidentified remains of the crew members of Oklahoma would be exhumed for DNA analysis. Modern technology has advanced quite a bit, and DNA profiles could help identify these sailors, so they could be properly laid to rest. The goal was to return the remains that could be identified to their families, and the process began in June of 2015, when four graves, two individual and two group graves, were disinterred for DNA analysis. By December of 2017, the identity of 100 crew members had actually been discovered and they had reached a total of 200 by February 26, 2019. Between 2019 and 2020, the DPAA continued to successfully identify even more crew members, and on February 4th, 2021, they announced the identity of the 300th unknown, a 19-year-old Marine from Illinois. As of June 29th, 2021, the DPAA announced the program was actually coming to a close, and that the remains of 51 crew members that could not be identified have been returned to Hawaii and will be reinterred at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific at Punchbowl Crater, with a ceremony scheduled for December 7th, which was the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. But the program was still very successful. They managed to identify a total of 343 lost crew members, including both Medal of Honor recipients, showing a success rate of 88%. By September 17, 2021, the DoD did announce that the number of identified was now 346, up from 343. They had one final push to identify the last few remains they had, and they did manage to identify a final total of 396 crew members. So their final success rate was 92.3%. Overall, it was solid news, giving much needed closure to many families, as well as proper burials for many of the men that died on that day. But of course, there were still a few that couldn't be identified, 33 to be precise, and they were indeed reinterred at the Punchbowl Cemetery as planned. And while Oklahoma's own final resting place isn't known, the site of her final battle is watched over by her distant cousin, Missouri. And I think it goes without saying that her and her crew's sacrifice should never be forgotten. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Spencer Kitson, 131-232, Josh Johnson, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Brian, Jack Carson's Road Videos, Hayden DeGrow, Lord R444, Mark Holding, Murder Drones Doll, A Person 723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hudson 2060, Icer for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Mr. Sleevy, Matt Weaver, Alaric Jaspers, Tom Red Lion, Ennis Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Joshua Long, Andrew Bowden, Brez Drenton, and Bradley Bowden. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.